All right, so that is recording. Um, so I was hoping today we could have a little chat about uh, visibility. It feels like a bit of an appropriate topic, uh, considering that it was uh, Trans Day of Visibility just the other day, and that uh, the day before that, and then recently, of course, there's the Arkansas um, anti-trans uh, youth bill that was passed and then vetoed, and then the veto uh, overridden recently. Um, so I just wanted to talk maybe about how visibility for trans people can be a bit of a double-edged sword. Well, you know, I think you hit on hit on it perfectly right there and saying it's a, a double-edged sword. Um, you know, I I will just say I've been very influenced. I don't know, are you just recording audio or also video? Uh, video as well. Yes. Video? Well? Okay. So this book just happens to be by my you know, chair side table, because um, I was teaching articles from it the other day in my class, uh, Trapdoor, uh, the uh, tr transcultural production and the politics of visibility. And that, that this whole anthology is sort of organized around the idea of visibility is kind of a trap for trans people. Um, and that part of what was driving a lot of this or, or what was an inspiration for that anthology was noticing the conjunction between what got called the transgender tipping point back in 2014, you know, when Laverne Cox is on the cover of Time magazine and Caitlyn Jenner is having her, you know, hot, hot moments in the media. Um, and that there was this sort of generally sort of celebratory uh, sense, you know, from li liberal society, kind of like, oh, like trans, it's this thing now. It's like, welcome new model minority to the table of social inclusion. And, you yeah. know, tell us your story. How did you get here? You know, and at the same time that that was going on, uh, you were seeing a dramatic increase in violence directed primarily at, uh, trans women of color, you know, particularly uh, black and indigenous trans women. Um, and that one of the interviewees in, um, in this anthology, uh, Miss Major, who was a, uh, a prison abolitionist activist, a Stonewall veteran, uh, somebody who'd been in the trans community and sort of in the trenches and on the front lines for a long time. I think she really nailed it when she said, um, what happens like when you know you've got Laverne Cox on time or when you've got you know somebody like Janet Mock having a New York Times best-selling memoir is that there is a lot of positive visibility to transness there are transphobic people in society who see that and who don't like it and are upset about it are resistant to it and they don't have the, the ability to say like get to Janet Mock or Laverne Cox right but there's a trans woman in their neighborhood there's somebody they see walking down the street it's like that visibility stirs up a reaction um, and that the reaction falls heavily on the the least privileged most vulnerable and precarious um parts of the you know trans community uh and so yeah visibility is good for whom you know yeah. um you know and then but you know the other the other thing that i see right now in in culture is um you know i i i think trans people have a story that we can tell uh, mm -hmm. in some ways about ourselves to other people, but to basically say, look, as a trans person, I have figured something out, which is that real change is actually possible. You know, you can do things that make yourself and the world around you different. And these things can scale, they can get bigger. And so, you know, I, I think about how trans issues have become so um, uh, weaponized and instrumentalized in the culture wars right now. There's a lot of attention being paid to trans stuff. And like, what 
it's like we we didn't ask for that spotlight. We didn't ask to be made into a media spectacle. We're just trying to live our lives. But you've been snatched into the freak show. The spotlight is put on you. Like, there you are. What are you going to do? What are you going to say? How are you going to use this moment that has arranged itself to put you in a position of getting some attention, both bad and good? And what do you say? And it's like, and I said, like, I think we need to use that attention that visibility as trans people to basically say this isn't about what you think it's about this isn't just about i always felt like i was a girl this is about saying real change is possible you can do pragmatic things that are within your reach to like make your life different and if we all get together and make our lives different together like a different future is in fact possible and we need to be dealing with some big things i mean like not just like racism or the collapse of the economy or public health crises but you know the climate yes. you know there is so much that is going on that really requires us to say not just think you know, like what is the technical solution to this problem, but to like really engage in the transformation of consciousness and the transformation of what we think of as the human in terms of what we think about our species life on planet earth. You know, like how is it that we can really come together in ways where we imagine a different future than the one we seem to be heading towards. And how can we as trans people kind of bear witness or testimony to say, this thing that I have discovered in myself for my own survival, I know it is a possibility in anyone. You know, mm -hmm. I know that we all have a capacity for transformative change. Let's get busy, y'all. Hit there on a few points that I, that I wanted to get a little bit more into. Um, specifically um, sort of inclusion and exclusion of identities, uh, I think within and outside of the community. I know in a lot of, um, when it comes to, to visible trans people, especially in the media, there often be, seems to be a very intense focus on the degree to which they've medically transitioned. And I know for myself, at least in my experience in the trans community, there is also within the trans community, you know, people who think that it's sort of a requirement, like it's, there's a medical requirement of, of medicalized dysphoria, like diagnosed dysphoria in order to truly be trans, whatever that means. Um, so I just, if you had any thoughts about sort of like why that's become such a fixture of uh, exclusion and inclusion. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, these aren't new, like, these aren't new debates, right? So every time we get, you know, come into trans community or what have you. So, I mean, in other words, when I transitioned in like 1999, 2000, these were new to me, um, these debates. And so at that time, it was transgender versus transsexuals within community. Um, however, that wasn't the first time that that debate had occurred either. And so part of, part of the emphasis, I think, on medicalization has been as, I mean, and this is borrowing from the work of Vivian Namaste, the, the historical erasure of um, trans people, but more particularly transsexual people. And so, um, you know, the necessity to um, raise awareness of, those who you know identify as um you know the sex opposite to who they have been assigned at birth and then seeking medical intervention um is a, in is very important and so i think part of the the way that the media focuses on this has been through um I mean, decades of, tra of transsexual people trying to advocate for access to this. I think another reason for, you know, the 
the emphasis on medical transition has to do with the, again, uh, a gender binary that structures society in which, um, you know, we see sex in particular and gender as being affixed to the physical body, affixed to biology. And so part of medical intervention is to embody this sex and gender, particularly in terms of the ways that um, we have been told legitimate men and women should look like. And so that that raises um, you know the medical establishment as in, incredibly important, and it is. Um, but it also you know creates that you know o that emphasis on needing to transition medically. There are particular kind of hierarchies that exist within within communities, and and I you know I experienced this too um, in Toronto with uh, because I had undergone chest surgery or top surgery but didn't didn't choose to go on hormones right away and it was always like a real pressure point because you know one's authenticity is in question when you don't follow a particular schedule or a particular protocol for transition um and that that can be incredibly incredibly hurtful and incredibly divisive as particular identity pe people not identities but the people behind those identities are told that they're inauthentic or that there's you know a, a, you know yeah inauthentic and then not included in in community so you have a marginalized person within society being marginalized within community because they don't meet the markers for what has been understood to be you know authentically trans <laughs> I think that's a, a really good point that you brought up towards the end there of sort of this back and forth sort of switching almost of the ways in which um, these identities interact. And you talked about how, you know, this sort of the medicalization was a debate back when you transitioned in 1999, 2000. And nowadays, um, it still is. And, you know, these sort of discussions keep coming up and keep evolving, I guess. Mm -hmm. But sort of my question uh, regarding that would be sort of like, where do you think these are going? Like, do you think we're going somewhere with these discussions? I, well, okay, so so the, the, the paradox, okay. So to answer your question, we have to take it into, we have to take into consideration the society in which we live, right? And so me being you know somebody who teaches human rights and from a critical perspective um i always start with you know we live in a liberal democracy and what i mean why that's important is in terms of liberalism you know we we really stress the individual um and we stress you know individual autonomy and when we look at the, I always say we have to look at the economy that we live into, right? We have to look at all the material, like the, the structural power relations that frame our society. So if we look at our economy and we see that we're living within capitalism, but more specifically neoliberalism as a, as a particular regime of accumulation, neoliberalism, one of the definitive features is that's hyper indiv individualized. And so, you know, it's anti-social, um, tenants are that it it urges us to privilege ourselves our identities um and so what ends up happening is that we we live in a time where identity becomes incredibly important and there's this push to define ourselves not only to define ourselves but to to take care of ourselves and there's that i mean that neoliberal um, push for personal responsibility and autonomy. So what that does is it privileges identity. And that's not the fault of the individuals. That, that is like, it's a social phenomenon, right? And so, and couple that with, again, the erasure of identities or the marginalization of identities. When people grow up without the information 
to know who they really are. And then they discover who they are, you know, whether it's through moving or access to information or online community or what have you, that identity becomes incredibly important. It, it becomes important to celebrate. It becomes important to pursue, um, to embody, to experience. And so there's, and, and when coming from the margins, there's the need to assert that identity. And so we become communities that are rooted within personal identity. And I say all of that because I don't want to discredit the fact that identity is incredibly important. Yes. At the same time, do I think that we're going to move ahead by asserting identity and to, to, to talk about identity? It's not an either or question, but no because there's going to be these divisiveness. I mean, the thing with identity is that you have to have particular criteria of belonging and unbelonging. You have to have inclusion and exclusion. And because we live in a society that has limited resources and we're seeing these resources in, like increasingly clawed back, um, there's a competitiveness there. Um, so there's a competitiveness for social recognition, there's a competitiveness for material resources, and it's often defined around identity, not personally, but even institutionally. I mean, institutions and organizations are funded based on service mandates, and these service mandates are often identity-based. Um, so you have these, you have this, you know, setup of competition, and I don't think that we're going to get further ahead by asserting identity and education of identity. I think we get further ahead when as a community, we start to define issues, political issues that we have in common um, and what we want, like what, what do we want for the world that we live in and what issues do we have and how can we then tackle those issues? So it comes back to, you know, the, the theoretical notion of trans being an open concept that allows us to not be limited to trans subjectivities, but to talk about the ways that, again, um, colonialism is built into these definitions of trans. So if we look at that, for instance, and we look in our community, how integrated are two-spirit people in trans communities when trans in and of itself is a Western colonial concept. That its very definition is rooted in the gender binary. How are we not seeing, you know, um, indigenous resurgence or sovereignty as a trans issue? Part of that shows the settler consciousness behind trans and, and asserting one's identity, right? So why are we not saying to our settler state government, um, you know, we need to look at uh, the issues of missing and murdered Indigenous women. You know, we're responsible for that as, you know, uh, settler colonialism being defined as the logic of elimination, that's ongoing happening. And that's happening to mainly, you know, street-based Indigenous women often engaging in sex work, can, which then leads to like, can we talk about the decriminalization of sex work? Can we talk about, you know, um, private property and land distribution um, and distribution of resources? Can we talk about you know, the politics of race and racism and inherent whiteness within you know, the Canadian nation and also within you know, quote unquote, our communities, who belongs and doesn't belong? Um, you know, again, within a Canadian context, Vivian Namaste quite a while ago was raising awareness of the, you know, the Anglo chauvinism that exists in Canada, even with terms like transgender. Um, or trans, you know, transsexual or what have you. Um, so we have all of these divisions that we need to talk about. We could talk about the politics of nation. We could talk about whiteness. We can talk about race. We can talk about, you know, the economy and, and, and capitalism. We can talk about um, land and resources. 
but instead we're fighting with each other about who's more legitimately trans. And that to me is, is quite tragic. And it's, it's a real diversion. And it's not a diversion like, again, I don't want to blame individual people because, uh, you know, identity is incredibly important, but we have to ask the question, why is it so important? Why are we and our position in the world, why is it, you know, so dependent on people understanding how we identify in terms of gender? Like, why isn't it something else? you know on your question about like is isn't rage just something gonna isn't it just something that you will just it will burn you out you know like burn you up burn you out um and you know this is where you know i would say like you know i'm not and i hope i don't come across this way in the our conversation it's like i'm not like an angry pissed off person all the time you know no, <laughs> just like, right you know and um you know um but i think it's really important to be in touch with one's rage and mm -hmm. that i i would make a distinction between sort of being angry or pissed off or disgruntled or out of sorts um about something um and rage. It's like, I think of rage as something that is more primordial. Mm, um, okay. And that, um, um, yeah, you know, and that the way I was writing about rage in that article, it was, you know, for your listeners or viewers who, who don't know it, I mean, basically it was me doing a kind of a performance art piece where, you know, I say like, okay, like trans people are, you know, called monstrous and unnatural and, you know, whatever, like, and that this is like supposed to be a, you know, a put down. Uh, and so we're like, okay, like you're putting that on me, like, let me put that on, wear it back at you, you know, so yes. to speak. And, um, and that the point I was making was like, as a trans woman, it's like, there is a way that I do identify with Frankenstein's monster in the sense of like, mine is a body like you know torn apart and sewn together again in a shape other than the one you know it was born with it is a i have become an assemblage of you know um incongruous parts um and so you know i kind of read the frankenstein monster from a trans perspective but you know i write about the rage of the monster in mary shelley's novel you know that it is basically enraged at being alive but being made alive in a way that ex excludes it and throws it out of like the order of creation and being and nature and and so like for me like that's a very like trans and queer way of thinking it's like no it's like i exist i'm here like i am like this i am part of being and so like there's a way there's got to be this way that how let's just call it the dominant culture, you know, the cis het world, you know, the heteronormative world, whatever you want to call it. There's a construction of nature, the normal, the possible of ontology that is actually false because if it can't accommodate my actual presence, it's like, it's wrong because here I am, you know, just like, right. and so like the, the being, of the trans monster, it's like, is this challenge to the way that dominant culture imagines reality to exist? And that can be scary, right? You know, scary for people who are invested in a particular notion of the real and of nature. And that, but like that experience of power attempting to make you not exist because it doesn't imagine the possibility of your existence and your very being is an affront to the the ordering of the world it's like that is rage right that is the the insurgence of of like of from like being put in an abject place being thrown out you know like lucifer gets thrown out of heaven right it's just like it's like this sense of it's like don't 
tell me that being does not accommodate me because here I am. And that, that insistence on a monstrous living vital presence that disrupts the order of the world. Mm -hmm. um, that's to me like that's rage. It's like rage is the thing that pushes you into that. But like, you know, kind of like once the rupture has been made, it's kind of like, ah, here I am. It's kind of like, okay, now let's have an interesting conversation. Now right. let's just hang out, you know, now yeah. it's sort of whatever, but it's almost like a, a, a birth experience, you know, that, um, you know, and the other thing I would say is like, it's not just rage. I mean, I've, I've kind of been playing around with this in some of my public talks recently. I'm saying like, well, maybe we could think about what I was talking about there as a non-binary affect, you know, it's like, it's not just rage, it's also joy, you know, it's just like, I like the joy of existence. It's like, it's a celebration of, of being. It's like, there's something just, you know, exquisite about existing, you know? And so like both like that, that sense of deep, pleasure and joy and awe at just being, you know, that is denied, suppressed, uh, power works to eliminate it. It's like the, the rage is connected to the effacement of the joy, right? And so it's like, it's both at the same time. It's like, yeah. it hurts to be alive and it's beautiful to be alive. Ah, both, right? Absolutely. And so, yes. <laughs> For me, it's like rage isn't just um, the being pissed off. It's about like accessing like that really primordial state of affect that it, like puts you puts your present moment in contact with the you know the what I think of as like the groundlessness of being you know the the void, you know, that we all come from, you know, the thing that, the, 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 the space that pre-exists whatever is in it, you know, like that pr primordial, you know, like it is in early Genesis, you know, it's like the, you know, you've got the wind moving across the surface of the waters over the face of the deep, you know, like it's that abyss, you know, it's like, it's the abyss erupting into the quotidian. Like that for me is transgender rage, you know? And so I don't see it as something that depletes me. I see it more like, you know, if we're going to talk about mythology, it's like, you know, when like the the titans are fighting each other it's like you know it's like when you touch the ground it's like it actually you know makes you stronger you know like the titan gets thrown down and pinned it's like they touch the body of the earth and it renews their strength you know and so for me like that sense of trans rage is about not finding strength by becoming grounded in something but finding one's strength by surrendering to the groundlessness of being that we all emerge from and um you know, it's a, it's like a dark passage. It's like, it's a falling into unrepresentability, you know, into an unbecoming that then kind of insurgently comes back into the order of things. Um, so it doesn't wear me out at all. It's, a, it's enlivening, you know, like that's where, you know, that's actually where that article ends. It's like, you know, may you find the enlivening power of darkness, you know, within yeah. yourself. Um, and may you, may you. Mm -hmm.